No, I did not make all of Titan Souls in 24 hours. What I did do was create a boss battle that had enough mechanics in it that if somebody wanted to, they could take this example and create a Titan Souls-like game, similar to Titan Souls. But before we get into the video, my name is Helper Wesley, I've made these games, and I make weekly devlogs. Let's create a boss battle. Starting with, I wanted to make something similar to Titan Souls art style without putting a whole lot of effort into it. So the same way I would use blocks to prototype a game in 2D, I'm going to use cubes to prototype a game in sort of 2D. Using a 45 degree perspective, so the tops and sides of these pillars are all going to be the same length. With the top part being brighter than the side part to make it look like there's a light shining down on top. I wanted to make sure that it at least looked pretty good, so I made some blocky grass to go along with all these pillars and walls. And then I created a boss and player character, blue and red respectively, to show which one's good and which one's bad because, you know, blue is good for some reason and red is bad for some reason. It's just how things are in video games. After creating the art I needed for this particular boss battle, I created the arena by feeling out where I wanted things to be. I didn't want to make a super complicated game since I was creating this as an example for people to follow, as a jumping off point to make their own games. So the idea was the boss was just going to slam down in the middle of the scene, maybe having him move around, maybe not. But if I could get the boss to rise and fall, then I could make a game mechanic out of that. But before I got there, I had to start with the player themselves. So I gave them the basic top-down mechanics, tweaking the acceleration and deceleration of the character to get something that felt pretty good to play. And then I went through all the sprites and changed their collision hitboxes, so they made more sense within this perspective. So from this perspective, the only thing that should be colliding with the player is what would be the width of the pillar. So parts of the pillar that, from this perspective, would be standing up off the ground, they wouldn't be colliding with the player in real life, so we need to change the hitboxes so that makes sense. So I did that with the player, the walls, and the boss themselves. I had previously told someone that it was pretty easy to adjust the z-ordering of objects in the scene based on where your player is in the y-axis. But then when I tried to do it myself, it was... it turned out to be a little tricky. Not complicated, just for some reason it didn't want to work half the time, until I finally got this. So now regardless of which pillar it is, they will all have their z-order changed to being behind or in front of the player based on where the player is in the y-axis. So if the player is below the pillar, the z-order will be below the player, so that way the player is standing in front of the pillar. I hope that makes sense. So now that I have basic movement and area mechanics down, I wanted to move on to combat. In Titan Souls you have an arrow, but I didn't want to copy that entirely. And drawing a bow and arrow in this style was not going to look right no matter what I tried. So I gave the character a rock. I wanted the player to be able to pick up the rock and throw the rock, and for the rock to actually show up on the character while they have it, and then go away while they are throwing it. And this is done with a pretty simple object variable for the player. So they have an object variable called held or holding or has stone or something like that. And when it's zero, they don't have the stone. And in that case, the stone sprite that's attached to the player doesn't show up, it's hidden. Or the object variable is one, meaning they do have the stone, which means they picked it up at some point. And in that case, the stone shows. And when you click the left mouse button, you're able to throw it. So that variable is the condition for the throw, which basically does what any kind of bullet mechanic does. Except instead of just shooting off a bullet, which in this case is the rock, in the direction of the mouse, it also takes away that variable, so it tells the player that you no longer have that rock, which means the rock attached to the player goes away. So now we have a projectile that we can pick up and throw around. The next thing is the dodge or dash. And I was considering locking this to the directional keys, but that was going to be a lot more work than just telling the player to go in the direction of the mouse. So I went with that one. And the way this works is there's a timer that works for the cooldown of the ability. And when that timer is finished, then you're able to right click. And when you right click, it disables the top down controls, so you lose control of the character. And then it applies the force in the direction of the mouse. And the reason your character doesn't go through walls and things is because of an event we placed earlier that separates two objects, in this case, the player and walls. So now we have a dash, 
but it doesn't look very good. So time to play with some particle effects. Nothing complicated, just the player being applied as the texture for the particle, and then have the particle follow the player around for the duration of the dash. Putting the boss into the scene was pretty straightforward. I hadn't written it down anywhere, but in my head I had pictured there'd be a shadow on the ground, the boss rises, and then falls and lands where that shadow is, so you know not to step where the shadow is. I never did go with the idea that the boss would be moving around the scene, but the shadow is still a good indicator of where the boss is going to land, so you're able to get out of the way before they land. So the way this rising and falling works is cheating, because I'm sure there's some clever mathematical way to do this, but I'm just using forces and two collision boxes. So there's a start and stop on top and bottom of the boss, and when a timer ticks, telling them that they've spent an appropriate amount of time up in the air or on the ground, then they'll have a force applied to them that sends them up or down. And whichever direction they go in, they will just keep going until they hit one of those collision boxes. And just like the dash, this didn't really look as good as it should, so I added a particle effect. This one is just stationary to where the shadow is, and when the boss slams onto the ground, it grows in size and then fades away. So it's kind of like a dust effect, if that makes sense. So when you slam down, you get this like rush of air or wind that comes out from underneath the boss. I mean, it's blocks, so it doesn't look as good as it could, obviously. But it does the trick and adds to the feel of the impact when the boss lands on the ground. Now we have a player that moves around, a weapon we can throw, a dash we can use to dodge things, and a boss that sort of attacks. Now we need health bars. Health bars are probably the easiest thing out of all of these things to do. For the version I'm using at least, it's literally just a square stretched using events. So the width of the player's health is 25 pixels times the object variable that is their health. So if the player has 5 health, the health bar will have a width of 125 pixels. And then if they get hurt, which will happen in this case if they get slammed on or they run to the boss, they will lose 1 HP and the bar will go down to 100 pixels. And I changed the origin point of this sprite so that the health bar constricts into the center. And I did the same thing for the boss. The condition being for the boss though that if they're hit with the rock, that's how they lose health. And each of these things only happen once, so if you get hit you only lose one health. Then I gave the game a win and fail state, so just a win and fail screen based on which one's health hits zero first, the boss or the player. And that's it, that's, that's technically a game, right? I mean, it's really boring, but it's technically a game. I mean, it has no sound and it's really boring to play, but it's technically a game. So to make it more interesting, I decided to give the boss a projectile weapon. So every time the boss slams on the ground, they're going to spawn this projectile that will chase the player. So I went back to GIMP and drew some more blocky effects. This being an attempt at like a raised earth kind of look. Doesn't look like that at all. It's terrible. I don't know what I was thinking, but it works, I guess. I mean, no one's going to know what that, that is, but they know it's a thing they got to dodge. So moving on, this tremor effect, this projectile, is going to have two layers to it. One being the actual hitbox itself, the thing that will hurt the player if the player comes in contact with it. And then a particle effect that's going to indicate to the player that's where the thing is and make it look a little nicer. Each time the particle spawns, it'll be at max height, so it kind of looks like it's jutting out of the ground really fast and then fading away. Or at least that's what I hope it looks like. And then the projectile hitbox is going to be hidden so that that ugly thing doesn't get seen by the player. This is set up very quickly and tucked in with the slamming down event. So when the boss comes in contact with the bottom stopping collision box, it spawns this projectile and then gives it a force that goes in the direction of the player. And then when that hitbox hits a wall or a pillar, it destroys both that hitbox and the particle effect. And then just to give the game a little more life, I went to SFXR and created some really quick sound effects to put in for things like when the rock hits the wall or the boss, or when you throw the rock, or when you get hurt, or when the boss slams down, and stuff like that. These little things are basic, and they, they really aren't the best sound effects I've ever created, but they do the trick. And every little thing you put into a game to make it sound like a thing has happened is an improvement, with very few exceptions. I mean, you could technically put like a duck quack in place of where a player jumps or something, that would 
be weird, but it might be better than no sound at all. So, yeah, I'll, I'll stand by that. Adding sound effects when things happen helps, period. Somebody's gonna say something really weird about that in the comments, aren't they? So everything put together, this is the game. And really, this isn't a game to be played. This is a game to be taken apart and used for somebody else to create their own game. I've submitted this example to be bundled along with the other examples in GDevelop for people to use as a guide to make their own games. This prototype doesn't have it all, it doesn't have everything that you could ever need, but there's enough things in this that you could teach yourself how to make other bosses using these same mechanics. I mean, what are boss fights other than health bars and moving objects that take damage or give you damage when you get hit? Really though, that's all they are. You just as a designer need to pick what things are going to hurt you when. So yeah, that's what I got done this week. With any luck, this will be picked up by GDevelop, and if you download the app, you'll be able to download this example and use it yourself. And if you're in the market to make a game like Titan Souls, maybe this will help you get there. Like always, I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, maybe click on that subscribe button. And if you want to talk to me personally, the link to our Discord is down below. It's called the Game Dev Fireside, and it's a pretty chill place to hang out and talk about game dev. And if you decide to click on that link, then I will see you there.